Okay. Good evening. Welcome to Our Community, Our Health, a town hall series that facilitates a two-way conversation between researchers and community members across the country. This town hall, we're focusing on new findings in autism research. Our moderator tonight is Dr. Mickey Eder, Assistant Professor and Associate Director of the University of Minnesota Clinical and Translational Science Institute. My name is Jordan Live, and I'm the Communications Assistant here at Health Street. Health Street is a community engagement program at the University of Florida with a mission to reduce disparities in healthcare and health research. Health Street is dedicated to improving access to medical and social resources, creating opportunities for well being, and advocating for our vulnerable communities. To connect with a research study or to find out more about Health Street, please go to myhealthstreet.org and browse our initiatives and services. Throughout the town hall, you can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag OCOH, or you can send the questions through the Q&A function below in Zoom. So now I'm going to turn the floor over to our moderator, Dr. Mickey Eater. All right, thanks, Jordan. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, all four panelists at the same time, and then we'll let them uh, in the order that they're gonna be speaking. Uh, we will have questions and answers at the end, but please, as your questions arise, feel free to share them in either the chat box or the question and answer. And um, I've asked our speakers today to, add, to talk about how they think about the human body, health and disease, and how they use research to improve what we know about autism in this case, with the ultimate goal of using what we know to improve health. I'm pleased to introduce Mark Schleiss, and I'm just going to specify he is a medical doctor and professor of pediatrics in the University of Minnesota Medical School. He, he focuses on infectious disease and researches viruses, particularly cytomegalovirus, and works on vaccines, something we've all been hearing a lot about lately. Amy Essler is a licensed psychologist and associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Minnesota. She has clinical and research interests in the early detection and diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. We'll then hear from Suma Jacob, who's also a medical doctor in the Department of Psychiatry. Her clinical and research interests involve neurology, the endocrine system, and also um, she looks at genetic issues in relationship to the autism spectrum disorder. Finally, uh, we'll hear from Carol Matthews, who is at the University of Florida. We're delighted to be partnering with the University of Florida for this, our community, our health. She's a medical doctor and the Brooke professor and preeminent professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Florida. She's also serving currently as the interim director of the Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment. Welcome everybody, and I look forward to the presentations. So Mark. Well, thank you, Mickey, and uh, thank you, Jordan, for your hard work in getting this organized and set up. I, I took the uh, uh, directive and challenge that Mickey put forth about thinking a about vaccines in a sort of a whole body integrative kind of fashion. And uh, so I'm going to give just a very, very uh, simple uh, overviews of, of how the immune system integrates uh, together. When we give a vaccine, we aren't just providing an antigen to the site of inoculation, but we're really eliciting a complex interplay of white blood cell mediated responses uh, cellular messenger proteins known as cytokines uh, and immune responses both uh, in the lymph nodes and, and internally as well as in the mucosal linings of our body. So I'm going to try to give that flavor of an integrative whole body approach to vaccination. The next slide then gives us uh, just sort of a, uh, a basic uh, overview of um, what do vaccines do? How do they work? The immune system is actually incredibly diverse and involves integration and interaction among many different organ systems. The goal of vaccination is ultimately to integrate all of these responses efficiently for protection against disease. And I'll just say that, you know, we're still, I think, very, very early in our understanding 
of how these integrative responses can work together for immunization. Two types of immunity to think about in the context of protection against disease as well as vaccination, innate and adaptive immune responses. Let's talk more about that. The vaccine, vaccination, um, so I'm missing about 10 slides here because I think this is near the end. What's the next slide show? Okay. Um, yeah, somehow my slide order got mixed up. Well, let's go back. We'll just work with this. So um, this was meant to be a, one of the final slides, but it's an early slide. So I'll just uh, uh, begin by talking about the future. Uh, we, we are now in an era where we can do reverse vaccinology. So what's meant by that? Reverse vaccinology is an approach where we no longer have to empirically look at specific gene products or proteins and their role in eliciting immune responses. Rather, we can predict from the power of DNA sequence analysis and molecular biology what the uh, proper immunogen should be. We are stuck, I think, in the world of vaccinology with this uh, uh, approach of giving injections uh, in the arm, in the dirt, in the muscles, or in the uh, subcutaneous space. But we need to look to the future to more physiologic routes of administration, including the skin, mucosal sur surfaces. There's a lot of interest in oral vaccines, transgenic plants that might express proteins of interest. And then the idea that not every vaccine is going to work the same in every individual. Um, our colleague here in Minnesota down in Rochester, Greg Poland, has built a career around this idea of designer vaccines that match the vaccines that are administered to the HLA and genetic type of the individual who's receiving the vaccine. And then um, induction of innate immunity, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes, uh, is sort of a very new and very exciting area for vaccination because it's a, a real paradigm shift. I also want to just make the comment that we think of vaccines as being something that's useful for infectious diseases, but the Institute of Medicine really views vaccines as an immune modulation strategy that can help with many immune mediated diseases, anything from cancer to diabetes, to obesity, to autism spectrum disorders. Children with autism have uh, often very profound immune dysregulation. Uh, and so that might actually be a very exciting area for future vaccines as well. And then the particular pathogen that I study, cytomegalovirus, is actually the most common infectious disease in the United States. Uh, that causes birth defects and birth disabilities in newborns. Uh, about one baby in 200 in Minnesota is born with CMV, and there's a school of thought that CMV may be responsible for a substantial portion of autism spectrum disorders. The next slide uh, talks a little bit about um, uh, what vaccines have accomplished for us so far. And this uh, bottom left-hand panel just shows what happened uh, and when we licensed a measles vaccine in the early 1960s, we saw a profound drop in measles cases, uh, only to see these resurge in 2018 due to distrust and disuse of measles vaccine around the world. And in another era, vaccines were responsible for a great deal, excuse me, infectious diseases were responsible for a great deal of premature death in children, as you can see from these uh, tombstones from children uh, uh, in, in uh, the past decades who have died of no what are now vaccine preventable diseases. The next slide then gets into the issue of what kinds of immune responses do we see in a whole body integrative sort of paradigm. Innate immunity is the most common and important immune response that we engender every day. We are regularly bombarded with mo foreign molecules and the human body contains trillions of microorganisms outnumbering human cells by 10 to 1. Microorganisms make up to 3% of the body's mass. And we come in contact with over 60,000 types of microorganisms on a daily basis. Only about 1% <clears throat> of these 
are dangerous to people who have normal immune systems. The next slide shows us what happened in 1918 during the influenza pandemic. We saw a major emergence of a novel virus that the innate immune system could not control. And this was before vaccines for influenza even existed, but it underscores what can happen when one or 2% of the germs that we encounter actually cause disease. And the flu pandemic of 1918 was responsible for anywhere between 20 and 50 million deaths globally. The next slide shows us what some of the limitations of innate immunity are. Uh, innate immune responses occur when we first encounter a, a germ. Uh, they don't require any memory or any previous experience with that germ, but pathogenic organisms can overcome the innate response. So the solution is vaccination. And so now we transition from the limitations of innate immunity to the uh, importance of adaptive immunity conferred by vaccines. And one of the points I always like to make when I talk about these issues is ultimately the major goal of vaccination is to save life. Uh, this slide shows uh, the total peak pre-vaccine death rates from some of these vaccine preventable diseases. And I think if you click, there is a, um, a, a guide, go ahead and click advance, there we go. And this shows the total number of deaths uh, in the pre-vaccine peak for all of these infections versus the post-vaccine uh, reports after immunizations were developed for these diseases. The next slide then uh, takes us into this integrative function of the immune system and vaccines. The idea that there's a common mucosal immune system that integrates immune function throughout the body. And so the cartoon shows all of these hot spots in the human body for immune regulated responses. And the take home point is that cells, leukocytes, white blood cells that initiate an immune response at one site, such as the tonsils, can with memory traffic to all of these other sites, the intestine, the urogenital tract, Peyer's patches in the gut, the bronchial epithelium, and so we speak of a common mucosal uh, lymphocyte uh, tissue or malt uh, that in, induces responses at specific sites, but provides protection at distant sites. And this is the best example I could think of of the uh, integrative whole body immune responses that can be conferred both by natural infection and vaccines. And so one of the goals of vaccines is to try to in, induce these responses that will traffic throughout the body. The next slide shows in more detail where these uh, um, uh, responses can occur, liver, spleen, thymus, and the types of blood cells that are involved. And we won't belabor the fine level molecular immunology, but just to say that there is this uh, integrative response that involves the whole body, even the brain, including the professional phagocytes of the brain, the antigen presenting cells of the brain, cells known as microglia. The next slide asks how do we recapitulate immunity and protect the host? And one of the future goals of vaccination, I think is shown in the middle picture, the little girl receiving the oral polio vaccine. We give vaccines orally, intramuscularly, subcutaneously, intradermally, but probably those oral vaccines given at mucosal sites uh, either in the gastrointestinal tract or the tonsils are the key. The next slide shows where uh, we take vaccines in terms of public health programs. The ultimate goal of a vaccine program is to reach a point where you don't have to give the vaccine anymore at all. And one of the future goals of this sort of integrative view of vaccinology is to ask where does protection need to be conferred and how do we get to that point in the most efficient and biologically relevant fashion? The next slide shows the importance of social influencers. And Elvis was one of the first. Here he is on uh, the CBS News receiving his polio vaccine. Uh, no vaccine is perfect. And we've seen vaccine policies change over time, including the types of polio vaccines we give, uh, the advent of licensure and then removal from the market of Lyme disease vaccine.
the end of smallpox globally that allowed us to stop giving smallpox vaccine. Post-licensure surveillance is critical, and when we talk about adverse events with vaccines, we always have to consider the biological plausibility and the intellectual honesty and in exercise of the scientific method in trying to determine whether adverse events are present. So I think the next slide is uh, wrapping up, uh, and, and we need to think about science. We don't want anecdotes, uh, even though Jenny McCarthy says anecdotal evidence is scientific evidence. Uh, as, as scientists and public health policy individuals, we have to think more scientifically. And the next slide tells us that vaccines uh, are not associated with autism from scientific analysis of millions of children in large cohort studies. Uh, you can see here the odds ratios associated with thimerosal and MMR vaccine uh, that I think really taken this off the table now. I think this is no longer a, a matter of scientific uncertainty. And the last, last slide, I believe, uh, is uh, 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 the next presentation. So I think with that, I will stop. And I thank you for your attention. And I apologize for the misordering of a couple of the slides. Thank you, Amy. You're on mute. OK. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, my name is, is Amy Essler, and um, I am here at the University of Minnesota in the Autism and Neurodevelopment Clinic. And today I'm going to share with you an update on our most recent autism prevalence rates, both nationally and within the state of Minnesota. And I'm sharing the perspective really of how we can use health and education data to inform understanding trends in diagnosis and broad developmental and behavioral characteristics of children with ASD. So you can, next slide. Um, all right, so this tells the story of, of the history of this work. The research arose out of a grassroots effort in the Somali community to understand why they were seeing what they felt were high numbers of young children with autism in their community, as well as the concern that Somali children with autism had a sev particularly severe form of the disorder. It started with strong parent advocacy at the state and federal level, raising the alarm that preschool programs for autism in the Minneapolis area had unusually high numbers of Somali children attending them. And the concern was that there was some sort of unique risk factor for Somalis um, that was resulting in this. So in 2009, the Minnesota Department of Health completed a study looking at the number of Somali children attending autism preschool programs and they found higher numbers of Somali students than expected based on their overall proportions in the Minneapolis population. But the numbers fluctuated from year to year with some years showing no difference in prevalence. So then in the next step, uh, the University of Minnesota began receiving funding to look at this issue, first with a study to estimate prevalence in the city of Minneapolis. Um, that study, the 2011 to 2013 study, did not find differences in autism prevalence between Somali and white children, but it did find that 100% of the Somali children had intellectual disability, which lent some support to the community concerns that autism in Somali children was more severe. After that study, we were invited to join the, or we were funded to join the CDC uh, national network that monitors autism prevalence every two years. Next slide. Okay, so at the same time that questions about prevalence were being asked, vaccination rates began to be affected. Uh, Somali children started out with high vaccination rates, then plummeted in the mid-2000s. Went up again a little bit in 2017 when we had our measles outbreak, but once that subsided, rates started to go down again. Also in 2008, anti-vaccine organizations started targeting the Somali community, including multiple visits by Andrew Wakefield to the Minneapolis area. Um, so the question of whether there's an increased prevalence among Somali children has had significant impacts on public health. Next slide. So we are part of the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, uh, and that is the largest ongoing tracking system for autism in the United States. Uh, 
and prevalence is estimated by reviewing medical and educational records for a defined group of children in a specific geographic area in specific geographic areas in a specific calendar year. For these data, we are looking at children who were eight years old in the calendar year 2016 and who resided in the geographic areas shown here. And so in Minnesota, this was Hennepin and Ramsey counties, which represents a little bit over a third of the state um, population. Next slide. To estimate prevalence, we first count the number of children who meet criteria for autism, and then we divide that by the total number of children in that population. Next slide. As you can see, the prevalence of autism has been steadily rising over time, and our latest estimate is that 1 in 54 or 1.9% of children in the U.S. are identified with autism. Next slide. Yep. Prevalence rates do vary by state, however, and Minnesota currently has the third highest rate at 1 in 44 children. Fluctuations in prevalence rates are often related to whether states had full access to educational records and also whether the states tend to be places with high concentrations of autism services and supports. In Minnesota, North Carolina, and New Jersey have all of those things. Next slide. Autism prevalence work is also a way to study disparities in who gets diagnosed and when. Um, historically, Black and Hispanic children have been under-identified with autism, and we believe that this has been due to misdiagnosis and lack of access to specialized evaluations. 2016 was the first time when we did not find differences in autism prevalence between Black and white children, although we, con we continue to see this problem for Hispanic children. Regarding sex differences, the ratio has consistently been four boys for every one girl identified with autism. There are theories on why that is that I'm happy to discuss if people have questions about that. But moving on to the next slide. In Minnesota, we looked at the traditional racial and ethnic groups, but also separated out Hmong and Somali children to examine their prevalence. Somali due to the concerns about their higher prevalence and Hmong because we know that they tend to be under identified with autism. We did not find significant differences in prevalence across any of our racial and ethnic groups. However, sample sizes in the Somali, Hmong, and Asian groups were small, so we don't know for certain whether we just didn't have enough, a large enough um, sample size to detect differences or whether there truly is no difference in autism prevalence across these groups. Next slide. Actually, I'm going to skip this one and go to the next one. You might remember that I noted in our study that looked at just Minneapolis, we found that 100% of the Somali children with autism had a, a intellectual disability um, and suggested a more severe form of autism. We looked at this again in our expanded study that encompassed Hennepin and Ramsey counties, and we have consistently not found the same thing for the past two cycles. So in our latest data, 37% uh, of Somali children with autism also had intellectual disability, which is similar to the overall rate. Next slide. And then I just want to end with showing you the data uh, we track on age of first autism diagnosis. We know that autism can be reliably diagnosed by age two years and often sooner, uh, and this is important because early intervention is the most effective at promoting outcomes. However, the age of first diagnosis nationally is, is still over four years of age, and this has been a persistent finding over the past 10 plus years. We're not identifying children sooner, and that is also reflected in our stat that less than half of these children had received any kind of evaluation um, prior to age three. Next slide. In Minnesota, the median age of diagnosis was four years, eight months. Um, and while the vast majority of parents reported some kind of developmental concern occurring prior to age three, less than 40% actually received an evaluation by that age. Next slide. So why is this important? Um, well, the data tells us about who has autism and how we're doing with identifying autism equitably across race and ethnicity. Um, every number represents a child and a child who needs help and support. Um, the data also tell us that we need to move the needle on age of diagnosis, um, age of identification, and we need to continue our policy efforts and advocacy efforts and training efforts on early detection. Also, knowing that 2% of the population has autism helps us plan for resource needs. Um, 
We know that there's a serious provider shortage and these children who are eight in, in 2016 will soon be adults in need of supports. Um, so that's just some of the ways we can use this data um, to inform our services. And the rest of these slides just give you some more places to go to find out more information. This slide is the national um, CDC data. Next slide is our Minnesota specific data. Um, and the last slide is just my, my team um, contributes to this research. Thank you. So hello, my name is Suma Jacob, and um, I'm going to talk to you today about some brain-body connections and thinking about um, precision medicine and personalized approaches for autism. Next slide. So there's a common saying that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, and that's one of our biggest challenges in studying autism because there's um, a lot of variability and complexity. Um, autism presents differently at different ages and developmental stages, and multiple biological things contribute to it, and that also is a challenge in what we study. So I'm going to talk about several ways we're trying to parse or understand and deal with this complexity. Next, next slide. So the big thing is development is a key part of studying autism. So if we're studying brain and behavior, the brain changes dramatically from birth to adulthood. And this slide is just a quick overview to show you how much the brain changes in terms of sensory areas, synaptic areas. And there are also key sensitive periods of a lot of changes that occur very early in the years before three, as well as ongoing changes through adolescence and um, into early adulthood. Next slide. So one of the strategies we've used is to understand subgroups. And subgroups may have different biological causes. Um, they may have similar brain body related symptoms and respond to interventions better than others. Um, and, and this really is an important piece of thinking about um, personalizing or uh, giving unique treatment and inter intervention options to individuals with autism. Next slide. So as mentioned before, there are core symptoms of autism, which include social communication as well as restrictive repetitive behaviors, but beyond that, there are many other things that contribute to how someone presents. Um, as Dr. Essler mentioned, intellectual disability, there's a subset of individuals affected by that, language communication, um, many of the behavioral challenges we run into, such as anxiety, aggression, um, hyperactivity, impulsivity, um, as well as physical challenges like constipation or seizures, a subset of individuals have greater risk for seizure, have made it, we've, we've seen these subgroups of, in, of, um, of autism that relate to these additional types of symptoms um, and have tried to figure out what are biomarkers related to these as well as potential genetic contributions that identify these subgroups. Next slide. And so similarly, sleep and other disorders like OCD are closely related in terms of some of the symptoms um, advance. And next slide. So treatments as you go through often target these behavioral comorbidities or symptoms and we've remained having a challenge to find um, treatments for core symptoms other than some of the behavioral treatments that are done early, in early childhood. Um, so this remains a big challenge in, in the research in autism. Next slide. So with modern advances, we now have an ability to reach many more people. So with technology, um, one of the one of the approaches has been to um, 
reach larger groups of individuals and families affected by autism. And there are many large studies in the US as well as Europe and other parts in the world. And similarly, um, bring this information together to help identify these subgroups to, to figure out how to optimize and individualize care. Next slide. And so some of this has to do with getting data in real time and large volumes of data and how they can be used to figure out patterns and um, their computational models that are used to figure out overlaps, both at a biological level, such as genetics, as well as um, how the, the disorder presents differently in individuals. Next slide. And for genetics, um, we started with uh, a few genes, but over the last decade, they have identified hundreds of genes and read gene regions um, that are now associated with autism. So there are going to be subgroups that are affected with um, different genetic contributions. Next slide. And so one approach to dealing with complexity is to think about um, subprocesses and how it presents. So social processes, cognitive systems, such as um, intellectual capacities and how they developed, as well as sensory motor systems as repetitive behaviors, and then use the technology we have, such as brain imaging or ability to um, identify tasks or ways to pick up um, cognitive abilities, as well as biological differences like biomarkers, if there are different levels of specific um, hormones that give you clues, um, such as serotonin, if you're part of a subgroup of individuals affected with autism. And then look at how this develops over time in terms of brain development, but also social outcomes, as, as well as how an individual um, develops from childhood into adulthood. And so these are called trajectories and kind of looking at where things end up over time. Next slide. And so um, this is a busy slide, but it's just kind of approaches of trying to deal with this complexity. You, as I mentioned before, you can have computational models from this behavioral data as well as genetic data. Um, as we have technology like brain imaging and you're able to look at brain scans, um, we've now been able to do imaging in babies and follow them through adults and look at different um, circuits and if they're similar or different or even if some of these contribute to some of the sex differences, um, as Dr. Essler mentioned, the number of males to females. Um, there are new initiatives and in research to look at how learning or cognitive training can be done and with technology. Um, technology is really important for thinking about how to communicate or options to communicate, especially if verbal communication is a challenge, but also can be used to help train um, how to answer, how to solve problems or think about things differently or process information. Um, I mentioned some of the neuroimaging approaches. Um, there are new medications that are being studied in autism and um, looking to target things, um, systems like the repetitive behaviors or social systems, and there are trials underway. Um, as there are many large, large genetic consortia um, and studies, for example, um, in the EU AIMS where they're trying to combine these genetics and neuroimaging with large groups of individuals with autism. And then the key piece is community outreach um, to reach out to how do you get information back to families. So some of these new large studies don't just um, look for these new genes, they actually figure out a way how to get genetic findings back to families and their uh, clinicians so that um, individuals know what we're learning in real time. And then I talk a little bit about, I mentioned just gut brain, um, the brain and body are connected. There is a subset of individuals with autism that have a lot of GI symptoms. And so things like microbiome or studying the body with the brain are important in these subgroups. Next slide. 
So this is just sort of my final overview of this idea of thinking about precision medicine. And so in previous scientific approaches, we often take large, large numbers, um, put them all together and look at means and how they, and what the average response is. And in something like autism subgroups and looking at individual differences will be really important and how we mathematically approach that is important. Lifespan, as I mentioned, development is key. Um, how things are present and um, interventions or options are presented to babies versus adults, or even how someone with autism ages and what their mental capacities are as they're aging will be different. So the lifespan studies are really important. And so everything from genetics to um, to biological factors, to periods where it's easier to learn, such as windows when it's easier to learn language or windows when it's easier to learn social behaviors, um, to moderating and responses to stress and environment. These are all aspects of thinking about um, research and approaches to work with um, individuals with autism. And clinical and research partnerships, especially partnerships with the community are essential, um, as well as looking for outcomes like quality of life and overall health outcomes. And in Minnesota, we do have um, some national networks we're a part of, but also have created a regional network called FIND, where we um, keep families um, in the region uh, informed about things that we're discovering, but also hear from them about what they want us to look into and uh, creating ways to do this easily through the technology you have is an important way to continue research with autism. Thank you. Hi, Carol. Yeah, it took me a minute to find my unmute button. So um, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. I'm going to go back up to the systems level and talk about um, developing a Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment and in incorporating community outreach and community input actually into that and how that works um, and how that what that means for research. So I am the interim director of the new Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment. We started planning for this center about a year ago and we launched it in February, right before the COVID shutdown. Um, and the goals of this center were to develop a model service delivery program for people with autism spectrum disorders and other neurodevelopmental disorders and their families at the University of Florida. And then also to promote and enhance research efforts at US and throughout Florida on autism spectrum and neurodevelopmental disorders. Next slide. So we started with a group of people um, who had a broad representation, basic scientists, occupational therapists, uh, educators, uh, speech and language pathologists, behavioral therapists, psychiatrists, and uh, sprinkled it with a very large number of family members. We really wanted family members involved. And so many of the folks that are on this list have our parents and children with autism. Um, and this group has worked together for about a year to try to put together a program that is comprehensive, which I'll talk about uh, next. Next slide. So the idea here is that if you want to do research in autism, you also need to have the, the other additional pillars of clinical, good clinical care, good education. You need um, an infrastructure and you need uh, support. Uh, we also, uh, at the University of Florida, because we're a big college campus and also have a big community college, are very interested in I think an underrepresented uh, area of science, which is transition to adulthood. Next slide. So the first thing that we did is uh, to take a look at what we had in Florida. And what we know is that, as many of the folks who've spoken already, is that treatment for autism and neurodevelopment disorders is really multidisciplinary. It involves psychiatry, pediatrics, psychology, neurology, gastroenterology, occupational therapy, speech and language pathology, physical therapy, many, many others. These disorders begin early. Whoops, back up one, thank you. <laughs> they last a lifetime and they impact not only the person, but their family, their friends, and therefore service 
services have to be coordinated and integrated. So the first thing we did was actually take a look at what the services were in, um, in the area around the UF. And we found that we had services, but we also had a three-year wait for autism diagnostic assessments. And so when Dr. Essler talked about the idea that um, kids Families know that their kids have problems very early on, but they don't get diagnosed until age four. What we discovered is that actually was the case here. Parents were waiting on a list for three years to get an assessment. So we started just pulling the people together actually physically in the same room in these days of uh, electronic medical records and uh, Zoom interviews. We decided that in-person meetings, next slide, was really important to get people talking about cases, uh, figuring out who needed to do what um, to help the families. Next slide. The other, the, whoops, back up one more. The other thing we realized is that we didn't want to just provide support to the kids with autism. We needed to provide support to the family members as well as the young adults and those transitioning into adulthood. So next slide. So we hired two patient navigators and their job is really to provide connection to the families, to the patients and to the healthcare providers, to the education system, to make sure that the families get what they need and if they're falling through the cracks, we prevent that. So these navigators do not have clinical roles. They're really functioning sort of as case managers, but also as educators, both for the healthcare providers and for the families in terms of what we can provide, what the families need, what to expect. And they're also community liaisons. Next slide. So as of February, 2020, we have a physical building there where we used to be able to meet in person for about two weeks before we shut down the campus. Um, and that really actually has, uh, that's brought our wait list down from three years to zero. We were able to um, identify overlaps in the system to get people working together. The navigators helped to get families into the system, get the information that we needed. And so from a three year wait list, we went to a zero wait list. So really very effective in terms of promoting clinical care. Next slide. So then we turned to education. So we realized that in order to provide the best quality of life for our patients and their families, we also needed to educate healthcare, oops, healthcare professionals uh, with training in the autism diagnostic assessments. Next slide. Keep going. We needed to provide specialty treatment in uh, helping kids with problematic feeding, for example, training our speech and language pathologists to work with our behavior therapists to provide feeding therapy so that the gastroenterologists weren't putting in so many feeding tubes. Um, keep going. Next slide. And we also wanted to teach uh, other professionals, school counselors and teachers about what autism was, what the services were, and how they could access them. So we put together, next slide an online autism certificate, which will be available in the fall for anyone to take for continuing education credits that really provides a soup to nuts uh, explanation of autism from the neurobiology to the standard of care treatments. Next slide, keep going. And then the last thing that we wanted to do was to really help to support uh, the education of individuals with autism or neurodevelopmental disorders, tutoring support in high school and college. Keep going. And so we have two programs. We have the Spectrum of Success at Santa Fe College. Next slide. And next slide. We have Social Gators at the University of Florida. And both of these are outreach programs for kids on the spectrum who are in college or community college, or actually at uh, Santa Fe College, they're high school students who are dual enrolled. And this provides uh, specialized services in terms of tutoring, helping people write emails if they need to contact professors and they're not quite sure how to do it, making sure they don't slip through the cracks, uh, providing social skills training and support, and also socialization support. Next slide. So then the last piece and the piece that we're turning to this year is research. And just like with the clinical services, we realize that there's a broad array of individuals interested in uh, research on autism or neurodevelopmental disorders across UF. Next slide. But we can't always find them. There's a little bit siloed. Um, so I started by just sending out a survey. Who's interested in this field? Next slide. What we found was that occupational therapy had a fair number of people doing work. Psychology. Next slide. And basic science. Keep going but they were all disconnected from one another. They were all these little pods working independently. Next slide. So what we started doing is asking everybody in the, who worked in the field two things. Next slide. Who else do you know? And what we found is that there are people that we would never have thought of. There were people in environmental sciences who are specializing in how to build homes or 
downtown cities for people with autism, people in behavioral economics who are interested in how insurance reimbursed these disorders. Uh, next slide. And so we started making connections that didn't come out very clearly, but we started making connections between individuals and who they knew and who they worked with. Then we asked them one more question. Next slide. Who else do you work with? Even if they're not doing autism, who else do you work with? And then we added more as uh, researchers. We added neuroimagers, keep going, and genetics, and folks doing clinical trials. And next slide. And by this point, we now have a very thick and rich network of researchers who work across education, who work across disciplines, um, and who are now starting to come together on a very regular basis to collaborate on, on some of these projects. Next slide. So what the re just a taste of a few of the research projects that have developed in the last year. We have research projects that are involved in understanding how the brains of children with ASD and neurodevelopmental disorders are different from a neuroimaging perspective, similar to what Dr. Jacob talked about, and how those differences relate to sensory problems and physical motor challenges from our occupational and physical therapists, working with our behavioral therapists and our neuroimagers. Helping kids with ASD tolerate and participate in dental procedures, something that's a real problem for parents, getting their kids' teeth cleaned or getting cavities repaired. Uh, our ABA therapists and our dentists are working together on that one. Next slide. Assessing problems with chewing and swallowing, one of the problems that we see in feeding and the relationships to what, it, what the food feels like and the motor problems you may have as you swallow. Keep going. And that's occupational therapy and GI. Next slide. We have projects helping um, people with ASDs and NDDs partner with our um, researchers to, to help develop research projects that are relevant to them and to their needs. Next two slides, keep going. And creating assessments, helping us to create assessments that can be used to help with vocational training that are accurate and useful for children and young adults. So these folks are giving us input into what works and what doesn't work for them. Keep going. We have behavioral treatments that improve uh, self-injury and aggression, early learning skills in toddlers, toilet training, how to sit at circle time, keep going. Improving social skills in adolescents and young adults transitioning to adulthood. This is actually now being done through virtual reality, teaching somebody how to ride a bus and get off at the right stop, et cetera. And then at, finally, we've done a, a great deal of outreach to the community. We have a great uh, arts program here and we have a teaching zoo. So we have developed a number of programs that are specific to people with autism and neurodevelopmental disorders in partnership with our performing arts and our teaching zoo. So the, the last slide is really one more. So what's next? Uh, we have an annual conference to connect community researchers and clinicians with one another. That was planned for April during Autism Month. That will have to wait until we open up again. Um, we're developing additional educational resources like the online autism certificate that I talked about. And we're continuing to increase our coordination of research efforts and expand our collaborations, as well as involving citizen scientists and helping develop the projects that they're interested in seeing and the things that are of most relevance to them and to their families. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the everybody who is kind of a quiet audience, given our Zoom requirements, um, I want to thank all the panelists and um, <clears throat> pose a few questions that have been sent through the question and answer in the chat box. But um, also just say that I really appreciate the um, opportunity to hear from everybody and learn from their uh, their life's work, really. And so uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, one, um, one question was posed, um, given the inequities in identification and services for children and adults with autism, um, how, what are the strategies that are uh, potentially useful to overcome these types of iniquities? I think Carol s talked about a three-year delay in assessments, but are there other, and how, to how they've addressed that in Florida, but are there other strategies that anyone can comment on to address the kind of inequities in access to assessments and services? Um, I can discuss that. That's sort of what our CDC data is trying to look at in terms of what um, 
what the autism identification rates are among different racial and ethnic groups and also timing of diagnosis. Um, I think one of, one of the strategies that the CDC has put in place and many states have put in place are a lot of early, um, early detection efforts, a lot of campaigns like Learn the Signs Act Early. We have one at University of Minnesota, they're, they're all around the country and the goal is to um, get parents involved and train parents to be um, like parent advocates who learn about early milestones and when milestones get missed, they talk with other parents about how they can advocate with their physician to um, get an official screening or get a referral for a more comprehensive assessment. So I think some of those efforts are, are targeting this. There are a lot of training efforts for primary care and for early childhood um, child care providers or educators to know what the early signs of autism are and to um, make referrals as soon as possible. So I think there's a lot of awareness campaigns in several areas. One of the things that leads to inequities is just that we um, we haven't done a lot of research on what autism looks like in different populations and if it looks different, if, if, if we might be missing things because we're looking through the lens of the types of kids who've always participated in research, which tends to be more of the white, more affluent um, groups. So uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do um, and a lot of efforts in place, but this has just been a persistent, a persistent issue. Um, perhaps it's getting better since we didn't find disparities in prevalence this time around with black children, but um, we we'll probably need to collect more data to make sure that's a trend and not just an anomaly. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, and I'm going to reframe this a little bit. Um, a child. Uh, <clears throat> with developmental delays was diagnosed with a FOXP1 genetic disorder. Um, would actually, um, he doesn't have an official diagnosis of autism, but is wondering whether the FOXP1 uh, would qualify as a genetic disorder and whether that would uh, potentially um, lead to an autism diagnosis? Um, so I, the FOXP1 is listed as one of the genes that is associated with autism. Um, but whenever we, if you start with the gene first um, and disorders like Fragile X, some individuals can go through diagnosis and have autism and a subset may have some traits or features, but not enough to be diagnosed with autism. So it's not always a one-to-one. -one. If you have a gene, you have autism. Um, what is helpful about something like FOXP1 is um, you, these families with these specific gene areas or syndromes can gather together and learn all the associated symptoms that come together such as language challenges or delays. Um, so in some ways it gives you more information than um, about different things that could be related to the gene. Um, and if someone, if a parent is concerned, um, if their child has one of these um, genes that are associated, it's definitely um, worth going and having a diagnostic evaluation for autism because um, that that will give the clarity if autism, if there are enough um, symptoms that are related to autism, but it also opens up resources for services um, and connections then you could also have with the Fox P, P community um, and the, the subset of children that have autism within it. So I hope that was uh, enough of a summary. It's not always one-to-one, -one, but it gives you an, a lot more information to have both the gene information as well as the formal autism diagnosis information. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, are there recommendations from anyone on the panel about what can be said to the state legislatures, legislators, um, to encourage them to provide more funding for people with autism and their families. 
So now we're looking, we're kind of being asked, how do we connect uh, medicine and research to politics? And whether you have any recommendations. I would say from what I've seen, um, because our, our prevalence data gets used a lot for things like, you know, sound bites for politicians, but um, what's been the most effective is parents telling their personal stories and um, adult self-advocates telling their personal stories. That makes, seems to make the most impression on um, legislators. Um, but I don't know if others have, have things to add. Yeah. Another hope is groups, as parents have formed groups and network, they can also um, be able to, as a group, say these are the needs. I know in a lot of places like Minnesota, services for adults um, are, are areas that parents are interested in getting more. So um, groups like FIND, which we've started, but there are plenty of parent groups that they've formed um, in Minnesota where uh, coming together and then as a group talking to the state legislature is another way to approach it. Thank you. There are a few more questions. One of them um, asks, uh, and um, this may relate to the questions that were, comments that were made about anecdotal versus scientific evidence. Um, are there certain communities that have higher autism ratio than others? And if so, do we have any explanation for that? Um, I know Dr. Essler's talk was a good example of following that up with the Somali community and really looking at the data. Um, and I think that that's often what we need to do if there's a subgroup and it looks like that to do a formal study and look at it carefully. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't unmute for a second there. Um, we have not found any particular communities with higher prevalence of autism except white children. Um, and again, we think that that is more about health disparities and access to, to um, specialized evaluations for autism as opposed to um, actual, actual biological risk or something like that contributing to a higher rate. There have been um, some reports or community concerns about higher rates of autism in the Somali community, both here and in Sweden. Um, but when we've done system, systematic studies of prevalence, we haven't found a significant difference in prevalence there. Um, I think we want to keep looking at that question um, and to try to expand uh, to looking at autism prevalence across the whole state of Minnesota so we have a larger sample size to look at and feel more confidence in our findings. But to date, there isn't any particular racial or ethnic group that seems to have increased risk for autism. Um, there are certainly medical conditions, genetic conditions that come with increased risk for autism, but no like demographic group that seems more impacted. Could I follow up Dr. Ressler and just ask, you had mentioned um, an interest in improving the sensitivity of recognizing autism across different language and cultural groups. And um, might it also be that uh, the response of people within certain cultures may create greater stigma or greater recognition of perhaps behaviors that uh, don't um, aren't as familiar or recognized by by people in in families and cultural groups? Yeah, I think there's been a little bit of research on cultural differences in autism and it's covered a wide span. So some of what it's looked at is are our measures as accurate in non-white children as they are in white children? Um, do parents from different types of cultural backgrounds report different concerns than other parents. Um, are some parents more aware of autism symptoms than others? Um, and also, are some parents 
more likely to underreport concerns because of the stigma in their community. And I think probably all of those things are true to some extent or are different for different people. Um, stigma is something we talk a lot about for some of our racial and ethnic groups in Minnesota. It's been a, a concern that is talked about openly within the Somali community um, and the Hmong community and the Native American community. And it does end up preventing um, people from seeking services or getting diagnosed at times if they don't have the social support um, to, to seek some of those services. Thank you. If we can stay a couple of more minutes and impose on you, there is a comment that I would just like to share that um, one of the individuals participating today wrote that they have been diagnosed on the autism spectrum disorder. They're an adult. They're learning about their life and they just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists because this has been uh, an informative and helpful experience for that individual. And so thank you. Um, there is another question um, and this one um, is uh, basically asking whether adults who are diagnosed on the autism spectrum disorder uh, leading more complete lives or is the quality of their life improved uh, if you were to compare someone living in the 1990s uh, with the current day, um, are they graduating from college more often, uh, finding more employment opportunities, and so on? Do we, do we have any, Carol? I don't know if we have an answer to that. I think we have more resources in college settings um, for um, young adults with all kinds of disabilities and differences. But I have, I actually have to say I'm ashamed to know whether, I don't know whether they're more successful in graduating from college or, or and also what the metrics are that people would use for success may vary by person to person. I believe there are more um, adults with autism going to college, graduating from college, and, and becoming employed, but they are they still have high, high rates of underemployment, unemployment, um, and the vast majority of adults with autism continue to live in their, in their homes with their parents um, after adulthood, so we have a long way to go. Have the assessments evolved in the last 20 to 30 years? Yeah, yes. <laughs> we have um we have a couple of, you know, what's what are considered gold sta gold standard diagnostic measures for autism. Um they have been translated into multiple languages and are available in multiple countries. Um they're used in research uh and clinically and with those instruments we've been able to greatly expand our understanding of autism across the lifespan and I'd say probably the biggest development in the past decade have been diagnostic measures that have improved accuracy for very, very young children. We have a lot of um, advancement in early screening measures, early um, diagnostic measures that are um, allowing us to capture kids earlier. Um, so that's, I think, an important development. Thank you. Um, the last comment was a request to Dr. Jacob to summarize the uh, last half of her presentation because it was apparently uh, someone had difficulty hearing and I don't mean to put you on the spot. If it's possible, there was a request for a brief summary of the last part of your presentation. Um, the summary would be that there, the, I think the new ways we have with technology, both with computer um, access to data and very large sample sizes of connecting families um, in the U.S., in Canada, in Europe. Um, there are these very, very large uh, research, clinical research projects being done. Um, and the com combination of technology, like being able to do genetics through saliva with um, neuroimaging, as well as these large groups, have changed um, our ability to study autism with bigger numbers. 
and study more, find, identify subgroups and deal with some of the variability within the subgroups. And that's sort of the hope that we have going forward that we will be able to study it be better with this technology and these approaches. Thank you. Um, on behalf of my colleagues at the University of Minnesota, I'd like to thank our University of Florida hosts. I'd like to thank all the panelists, but also uh, express appreciation to our colleagues at the University of Florida for sharing this venue and letting us um, share some of the work that we're doing in Minnesota. And uh, Jordan, um, thank you very much. I'm gonna turn this back over to you. Okay, perfect. So that concludes our community, our health on autism and research. Um, I just want to know if you had connectivity issues or you just want to share or watch this all again, um, we will be sharing a recording on our social media very soon. So you can share it with your friends or take a look again. Um, definitely take a look at our website, myhealthstreet.org, and follow us um, and like us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and with that, stay well and have a great night. So um, just to uh, be current, um, please everybody remember to wash your hands. Be respectful for, uh, to others when you're out in public and uh, to be supportive of your friends and neighbors uh, as we all work our way through our current challenges. So again, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Slice, Dr. Essler, Dr. Jacob, and Dr. Matthew.